All right, taking out your tests, going over this, let's do this. Okay, so first thing, lattice energy. Now, lattice energy is tied to ionic bonding. Now, we don't spend a lot of time with ionic bonding because a lot of people in college think ionic bonding is the strongest type of attractive force. Now, ionic bonding is when you have positive ions attracting negative ions, and when this occurs, they make something called crystal lattices, and that would, of course, be a negative here, and attracting a positive. And this would go in three dimensions, and it would keep going. And, of course, this occurs, of course, when you take something like a metal who has a low ionization energy for electrons and something like a nonmetal who has a tremendously high uh, ionization energy, which means it takes a lot of energy to pull electron away because they hold onto them tightly. So in the pyrrhic table, up to the right are atoms we say have a high electronegativity, which means they have a high attraction for electrons because they have a small n or a great number of protons or or a high effective nuclear charge. Bottom line is, when you put a metal, generally speaking, we've learned they oxidize. They lose electrons in the face, usually in the face of non-metals who like to get reduced. And the reason why this works is because there's going to be a transfer of electrons. Now I drew this wrong in my haste, bad Grodsky. I drew this wrong because chlorine has seven valence electrons. We should be at that point. So what's going to happen, there's going to be a complete transfer. So if I were to draw a Lewis dot diagram of something ionic, it would look like this. Na lost its valence electrons, now is positive one. Chlorine, who started out, okay, with seven valence electrons in its outermost shell in the third principal energy level, gained one, okay, and of course this becomes negative one with brackets and charges, and that exactly, that is the Lewis dot diagram. We don't spend any time because these aren't molecules. We might write it NaCl or CaO and K2S, but these are not molecules. So when you guys mentioned double bonds or single bonds and all the other stuff and sharing electrons, a lot of your talk about Electrons were incorrect because these guys do not share. They do not share because they have a tremendous difference in how they hold on to electrons. Okay, nonmetals hold on to electrons so well, they attract others because of their high effective nuclear charge, and these guys don't. That's why metals like to oxidize. Okay, so a lot of you guys were talking about things that did not make sense. What I was after is the lattice energy to pull, let's say, we have calcium plus 2, and we have oxygen negative 2 in my crystal. And then we have oxygen negative 2, and we have calcium plus 2 in my crystal. And you may say, Why do I, how do I know they go in a crystal? When they're positive 2, or when they become an ion, by what? Losing electrons, remember Leo oxidizing, or gaining electrons, okay, they become charged and become ions. So these are not. So And the thing is, when oxygen or calcium loses two, it's plus two in all directions. So it's able to form a crystal or attract other negatives in other directions. And that's how this crystal lattice is born. And when we write a chemical form of CaO, it's the lowest ratio of ions. There's one what? Calcium to one oxygen in this crystal. So when I say lattice energy, what's the energy to pull these ions out of the crystal and make them into the gaseous phase. Well, that's a product of what? Coulomb's law. Force is equal to K, R1, R2 over the distance. We've been talking about this distance squared. So the size of the charges, party people, the larger the force of attraction and the more energy it takes to pull the ions out of the crystal. And of course, the smaller they are, also the larger the force of attraction. So I'm after which salt has the greatest lattice energy. Well, we have calcium plus 2, or we've got K plus attracting an S negative 2. Now, of course, this is a three-dimensional crystal, and it goes in all directions. But to pull these ions apart, we can see that K plus compared to calcium plus 2, okay, all right, is going to have a less of a what charge or we can say calcium plus two has got a larger positive charge 
larger area up. So it's harder to remove the calcium because of two things, really. Number one, it's got a greater charge than potassium, so therefore these attractive forces are greater between the positive and negative. Plus one and negative two is never going to be as strong as a plus two and negative two. So that's one of the reasons or one of the ideas. The other idea is that, and although I didn't draw this to scale, when calcium becomes calcium plus two, it loses two electrons. That means the protons outnumber the electrons by two, so this gets smaller. And the more electrons you use, the smaller you get. So here comes calcium, and by losing two, it gets extremely small. K as an atom is pretty big, but when it becomes K plus, it does get smaller, but no, not nearly as small as something that loses two electrons. And now why does that matter? Because if they, you have smaller ions, they can pack in this crystal tighter. So a smaller ion means you can put what? Them closer together, which means the distance is decreased, which increases the force of attraction. So for two reasons, okay, um, calcium oxide, uh, calcium is going to be a smaller ion, and it has a larger charge. And that's all about Coulomb's law, something we've been talking about since September. Okay. Now, if you think about what about sulfur? Well, sulfur has a negative two, but where is sulfur compared to oxygen? Look at your periodic table. Sulfur is below oxygen. So my friends in chemistry, it's actually a bigger negative two. When these become negative two, yes, they get bigger, but because this one starts out bigger in an N equals, what, three energy level, it's the bigger of the two ions. So therefore, for reasons of this D squared, NK plus having a single charge, calcium oxide is your answer. Okay, now, it wanted you to write a formula of a salt with the same metal. So I would pick calcium. Now, what I would do, knowing it's plus two, I want to choose something that gets even smaller than oxygen with a greater charge. So we look at nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon in row two. We can see that nitrogen needs one, two, three electrons to be as stable and fill its second energy level. So N likes to become minus three. We should know this. So I picked nitrogen because it's going to be what? Even a higher charge of the negative two, which would attract the plus two even greater. And if you're, again, the, so gaining three electrons would actually make it bigger iron as well. So some people picked fluorine. Now I picked, uh, now nitrogen is going to be minus three. That three comes down here. The plus two comes here. I accepted fluorine because hard to know that Yes, nitrogen becomes negative three. It's a bigger charge, but actually it's going to gain three electrons and get bigger. So its, so it's the diameter is going to get bigger. Fluorine's already smaller than negative one. So I, 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 when you went to F negative one, for those that picked fluorine, you were telling me it was small, and they're right. So being a small, okay, means that that would be lower the distance. So I allowed F because it would become a smaller distance Okay, as you go across, the, the effective nuclear charge increases. So I accepted that. Uh, I was looking for nitrogen with a, with a bigger negative, but it being negative 3, it's hard to know if it's negative 3 with a larger size would be um, as attractive as negative 1 with a smaller size, so I accepted both. Okay, really go over that. You will see that tomorrow or the next day whenever we take this, which is tomorrow. So let's go over this now. Okay, so this, I'm looking for you to pick out carbons that have one sigma bond. We should know that, I don't care if you've got a double or a single or a triple bond, triple, double, or single, the first bond has to be an overlapping bond. That's a sigma bond. So we have one sigma bond between these two. And number three, there's sigma bonds here. So which illustrates one sigma bond between adjacent carbon? So this has sigma bonds between this one and this one or this one, so two. Okay, three, okay, four, that's one bond. The first bond must always be a sigma bond. And of course, five, the first bond must be a sigma bond. The second bond must be a pi. This has one pi bond, this has two pi bonds. So the first bond, okay, must always be a sigma. Okay, that's, that's right. Uh, I was the second bond, I tried, or Sean Connery, so I was not a sigma bond. <laughs> All right, so the first bond was sigma. So this is a sigma. 
this is a sigma, this is a sigma. All these individual single bonds are sigmas. The double or triple, that next bond is a pi, okay? So if you can live through my bad impersonation, okay, rock on. All right, now, so the next part of this, okay, cleaning this up because I like to be clean. All right, which numerical choice illustrates two pi bonds? Well, if you have two pi bonds, that means you have one what? Sigma and then two pi bonds. You have to have one overlapping, so we're looking for a triple bond. So that's just two, okay? Which numerical choice would have carbons, okay, that have angles approximately 109.5? This is screaming to you for sp3 hybridization. How do I know? We need to have two regions of electron, I'm sorry, we need to have four regions of electrons surrounding, right? S and three Ps mean that we have four different orbitals. Look at these two carbons. There's this carbon is has one region and two regions. So this ones are not. Look at this carbon. Let's erase this. We're looking for four regions of electrons. And here's one. Ooh, Christmas in July, too big. Okay, so let's do it here. We've got well, we've got one. And I'm gonna go green here. So we got one, two, three, and four. Hey, hey. And how about else? What else we got? One two, three, and four. Okay, and what else they got? One, two, three, and four. Of course, that'd be a sigma bond there. Um, so, gosh darn it, three and four are the only places where the central carbon has four regions. You don't count the bonds. This is one, two for that one. This is one, two for that one. That's why this one's SP hybridized. This is SP, what, two, one, Let's do a different color because we can. So one, two, three. That's why this one is sp2. Okay, and that's where we go here. Now the question is: There is one carbon from the illustrated diagram above that is misleading in terms of three-dimensional spacing. Now what's misleading is that if you notice back to reality here, I have sp2 in the middle. So this sp2 means planar. That means this and this carbon and this h and this carbon are all in the same plane. Now it's hard for me to write, let's, let's get rid of that. What is sp2 hybridization? sp2 hybridization is when you have what? When you have that trigonal planar. Here's one, two, three. Okay, one, two, three. So there's my trigonal planar. Now this is attached to it. So this carbon is in the same plane as this H is, as what? This carbon is, and this H is. These are all in the same plane. What could be, okay, what could be um, a carbon that's not in the same plane? This, because it's a tetrahedral as what this one is, so the chance of it being on plane is, is, is 50%, okay, so this one has to be on plane, but this could, this could be bonding to something coming at us, going behind us, okay, okay, and so this is a tetrahedral, it's producing one uh, that's going at us, that could be this carbon, or one behind us, or two on plane. So in truth, these are the two answers that I was accepting. Okay, how should it appear? Either coming at us or behind us. Those have the two possible. The rest of these are in, the, are in that planar scenario. Okay, moving forward. Let's do this sketch. Now you should be able to do this sketch. A lot of people struggled. I gave you an order. Okay, I've got my carbon, I've got my nitrogen, and I've got my hydrogen. Okay, carbon has four valence electrons. So one, two, three, four. And we should know something about nitrogen. It likes to triple bond, but one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, so it's not going to work right now. Nitrogen needs to have eight. So does carbon. These are both row two elements. So I'm going to make myself another bond. And again, if you're not sure, evaluate. And some of you guys aren't evaluating. You left some crazy answers out there. Okay. Look, party people, if you take and evaluate this, this nitrogen feels like it has what? One, two, three, four, five, six. This carbon, oops, okay, it's not writing, but hey, this carbon feels like it has what? Maybe. It feels like it has one, two, three, four, five, six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So it feels like it has six as well. So 
people left this like this, you just can't do that. So let's get this out of the way. And get some more of this and get this and let's move. Let's make another double bond. Move that one and that one. So give me a red. And I move that there. Give me a blue. Put that there. Now when you evaluate for nitrogen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This nitrogen feels like it has seven. This carbon feels it has two, four, six. Still not good. Okay. But let's not forget that hydrogen brings one to the table too. Okay. So hydrogen feels like it has two, which of course it would because that fills this first energy level. So carbon feels like it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nitrogen feels like it's seven. The only thing to do here is add another bond. And we should know that, oh, Christmas, nitrogen likes to have chill bonds. So this one comes here. And this one comes here. Maybe. Oh, bye-bye. Okay. You can see that I'm having some issues. Okay. Beyond the normal ones that I personally have. Now. Okay. Let's get rid of that. So that's my Lewis dot diagram. And if you need to evaluate, maybe nitrogen feels like it has eight. Carbon feels like it has, it's eight. And hydrogen feels like it has two. Okay. It's not like in this part of my uh, thing. So let's continue on. All right. Hybridization. Well, count the pairs of electrons. There's one region of, I should say, count the regions of electrons. There is one region on this side of the carbon and another region. So that means an S and a P, all right, came together and made SP hybridization. Okay, so this is SP hybridized. And I'm really having a good time with this tonight. Okay. Total sigma bonds. We know that one bond has to be a sigma. This is a triple bonded area, but one of these three have to be a sigma. So that's going to be two. Total pi bonds. Well, pi bonds when you have the second and third. So there's two extra bonds beyond the first sigma. So there's two there. Bond angles. Well, this is SP. SP only has 180. Be consistent. And of course, if it's 180, it's linear. Yeah. Now, if you didn't see all that, draw yourself a sketch, okay? And I'll try to do that here. Uh, so I'm going to start with a carbon, which is going to be SP hybridized. So there's one SP, another SP. And then we have the, uh, of course, let's put the valence electrons in, the, the blue. It has one, two. And now because it's SP, that means it has what? Two other orbitals that are unhybridized, two Ps that are unhybridized, right? So here's one going up and down. So this would be PY. And of course, there's one coming at you, PZ. And, and of course, that same one's going behind you. So let's put the valence electrons in. I'll put one here and one here. Carbon has four. Let's uh, rock and roll with the hydrogen. It's just an S and it has one. And now let's do the nitrogen. I can explain this without hybridization. Some people think that nitrogen is hybridized. It's all good with me. But I know that nitrogen has, let's just do an unhybridized P. That's PX. Let's do PY because I like to. This is PZ. Very PZ if you practice. Okay. I know it's bad. P, uh, you get the idea. This is PY. This is the X. And this is the Z. Okay. Don't forget we have an S if we're going to call it unhybridized. Okay. And we're going to put our five valence. One. Two, there's our sigma, three, let's do four, and then one up here for five. And where is my pi bond? Well, there's one here. There's my sigma. And then we have one what? In front and behind. Okay, and there's my two pi bonds. Top and bottom, front and back. Okay, all right. Moving forward through this. Some people found this to be challenging. Uh, carbon, I know, likes to make four bonds. Okay, so if I put one, two, three, four, okay, throw in my oxygen, who has six, and then I have two hydrogens, okay, and if you're not sure, well, put them here. Here's H with one. Here's another one with one. And the problem that I have for a lot of people that drew this, this is a row two element, which means what? It's limited. It has to have its eight. It's octet, right? So a lot of people 
okay, we're putting this, it had too many. So this has to have eight. So if I move this over here, okay, get rid of this, whatever this dot that's supposed to be, put it here, oh, blue, yep. You can see carbon still has six. The only way to make this work is take two of these, okay, and put it here to make a double bond. Now carbon, by evaluating, has its what? Has its eight. All right. And there's your structure. This oxygen has its eight. If you try to do any other structure by this, put the H's on the O, all right, and do formal charges, you will not get zero. So if you put this H on the O, like some people did and got all confused, which it can work, but you're going to have a lone pair here. Okay, that's not the best structure. Okay, carbon likes to bond and have lone pairs. If you do, and again, if you did the if you did formal charges, it wouldn't make any sense. So this is a carbon double bonded to an O and two H's called formaldehyde. All right, and again, formal charges are your friends here to help you understand that. All right, so the hybridization is sp2. Why? I have how many regions of electrons? One, two, three. And of course, electron domain geometry, okay, is going to be the trigonal planar. So I'll just write trig planar. It's three things. Okay, electron geometry is exactly the same because they fill the polarity. It's polar. How do I know? It's got a lot more le electrons up here. And of course, the dipole moment pushes from the positive to the negative. You don't have to draw that, but this is very asymmetrical. This oxygen pulls electrons up. So there's a lot more electrons in this region than here because O is to the right of the pyrrhic table. Bond angle, because it's sp2, is 120. Okay. Now, a lot of people got this one wrong. I saw so many pu people put this one. SE has six valence electrons. So I saw this, 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 and this. And they put the hydrogen, and this is correct. I have to, uh, this makes the eight. SE is beyond row two, but it still wants to have eight. So people have said this and say, okay, it must be linear. And that's wrong, okay? Because what do we know about four pairs of electrons? One two, three, four pairs in different places give me sp3. And sp3 never gives me a linear. This is a tetrahedral when it comes to electron domain geometry. But the geometry of where these electron, these atoms are is not linear, it's bent. Why? Because if you draw this sc in the middle, you're going to have two coming at you, here, and one coming at you. Here's the h, one coming behind you, Here's one lone pair, and here's another lone pair. Okay, so the structure of a tetrahedral is not planar. Okay, so so many people got confused by that. This is just like water. And of course, because it's asymmetrical and you have this what? Electron rich area up here, we're going to call it polar. Okay, and we do so for the sake of the fact that SC is up to the right. I know some people say the polarity here is very similar. You can't know that from this test. So polar. And of course, the bond angle is 109.5. Of course, it's less than that because these two lone pairs push them downward if there's no what protons. Okay? So many people made this linear. Okay? You got conf get confused. Four pairs is tetrahedral. Think three dimensions. Okay, so people are hating on me, okay, on Twitter this afternoon about this. Now, actually, I have no idea, but the point is, how did I know the H belonged here? Let's break this down. So I've got a carbon. I've got an oxygen. And let's just draw it like this. Carbon makes four valence electrons. And then we have a hydrogen. Okay, we know it has one valence electron. Let's not forget we're adding an electron here. Okay, now we know that oxygen has six valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we're going to add one from the environment. Okay, boom. All right. So what do I have here? Okay, I've got a, a scenario that's a problematic. I have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. Okay, well, let's take an electron from an oxygen, because it's all I got here, and let's make a bond here. Now, let's take an electron here. I, I'm just moving stuff around to make some sense of this, and move this here. 
Okay, so this electron, so what we have here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Very problematic. What are you going to do here? Okay, do you make another double bond to make this work? There's, there's problems. We added the one electron from the hydrogen, okay, um, and then we added one more electron. So we have issues here. One, two, three, four, five. So how do you add the hydrogen here and make sense of this? If you make a double bond occur here, then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So explain to me how this H has to be here. So we're going to get rid of this H, okay, for now. Okay, let's get rid of that H for now. It doesn't fit. It doesn't work. I'm going to put this electron back over here. All right. And so now, all right, I've got uh, a... Now I remove the hydrogen. Let's, let's, let's think about this. One, two, three, four, five, six. This oxygen has its six. One, two, three, four, five, six. This one has its six. One, two, three, four, five, six. All the oxygens have six. Carbon has one, two, three, four. Okay. And now we add one from the environment. And you know what? We're adding a, a hydrogen who has an electron. So I'm going to put that electron here. What the hey? All right. Only way to try to do this. As you can see, it can't add. And of course, all right, you can say, Mr. Grotsky, I don't like that. How about we do this? How about we take this electron and move it here? Fine. And then let's move these electrons over. Okay, let's move uh, these two over, okay, to make more sense. And there's so many ways here. And you can see I've got what? Carbon, let's by sharing. Okay, look, by evaluating here, this one is sharing seven. So who's going to come around? Maybe a hydrogen comes by, okay, with one electron. And there you go. There's your eight for that one. So if you notice, by evaluating, this hydrogen has two. This carbon is sharing its eight. But the problem is carbon only has what? Carbon only has uh, six Okay, it wants to have eight. So the only thing we can do is, guess what? Make another double bond happen there. Okay. So I took these two electrons, I'm going to put them here. And now you can see that this carbon has what? Eight. And now this carbon will have its eight as well. Okay, so you can see that everyone's happy. This is the only way it could work. Okay, and of course, rearranging this. What do I have? I've got a carbon single bonded to an O. I've got it, let's say, um, double bonding to another O. And then single bonding to an O and an H. Don't forget the what? Lone pairs. And because the whole thing is a what? Is an ion. This whole thing has to be what? Negative 1. But if you were doing this tomorrow, couldn't this double bond come over here? Isn't this sp2 hybridization? There's three regions of electrons in separate regions. So it's got unhybridized p that allows the double bond. So I would need to draw another what? Carbon double bonded to the O on top. That's two lone pairs with a double bond. One, three lone pairs with a single and then the OH. Definitely doable, negative one. Okay, and that's what, this was an extra credit, so if you got an X, I didn't count it. Okay, but these should have made sense. SP2, now if you said SP3 and you said tetrahedral, tetrahedral, fine. But this is, in my opinion, this is trigonal planar, and of course there's three going around, it's still the same thing. Okay, it is an ion, so it's not Okay, non-applicable or it's ionic, it's not polar, and the bond angles are 120 because of the sp2 trainer, uh, trigonal planar shape. Okay, SiO2, hmm, Si has four valence electron like carbon, so Si has four valence, one, two, three, four. Oxygen has our what? One, two, three, four, five, six. You say, why are you writing it and knowing it's double bonded? 
because I know the oxygen needs to have eight, okay? And silicon can easily have eight by double bonding, okay? If you put the, the electrons at top and bottom, and you put all the oxygens for um, the electrons for oxygen, okay, you'd move this downward, right? Move this downward, and you can see that silicon only has what? Four. It's not going to work. It wants to have eight or an advanced octet. So the only thing you can do is bring this pair over, bring this pair over, and that would still make eight. Remember, oxygen's a row two element, but now silicon will have its eight. Okay, this is just like carbon dioxide. Carbon and silicon both have four valence electrons. So any element below the other gives you the similar shape. Of course, this is sp hybridized because it's linear. There's only what? two regions of electrons surrounding it's sp okay so this is going to be linear there's only two shapes linear okay this is going to be nonpolar because of its symmetrical or the symmetry there's what same, same polar bonds on both bond sides on both so sides symmetrical to non-polar nonpolar nonpolar molecule and bonds are 180 okay number 21 write the formal charges for all the elements in both lewis diagrams next to each element Okay, so it might be helpful if you're having trouble with this to put in the um, electrons, and and of course sulfur has six, but a bond, okay, it's all all the electrons are already out there for you. A dash is a bond, so I'm just going to put two electrons for a dash, and two electrons for this dash, this dash. Now this is, of course, has two bonds, so it's two two pairs of electrons and I'm just going to put that out there and you will see that okay and it will be helpful if you have trouble with this problem now formal charges of course are bookkeeping and all we have to do is figure out of course, how many assigned electrons for each atom, and the goal is to get zero, or the lowest number possible outside of negative numbers. So let's go do this. Let's go pick a, ni pick a nice color, and let's go with orange. And so for this oxygen, we're going to see some patterns here. That is all the assigned electrons, two, four, six, plus half of its bonding. That's all the electrons we put, we bring to the drawing. So that's going to be what six valence electrons minus its assigned which is seven in this case, and of course it's negative one. So it's negative one for all the single bonded oxygens for the same reasons. Now this double, uh, this of course is another single bonded one as well. So that's negative one. And then the uh, sulfur, okay, has uh, one, two, three, right? So this guy only is assigned three. It's half of its bonding. There's no lone pairs here. They would have shown you that. So one, two, three. And so sulfur is six valence electrons uh, minus the three assigned. You get plus three. And party people, that's a bad formal charge, plus three. Okay, that means that it lost three electrons to make the rest of these work, and each one of these gained one. That's why it's negative one. Okay, all right, so back to uh, reality here, and so we have this single bonded oxygen, negative one, uh, this single bonded oxygen, negative one for the same reasons. We bring six electrons to the table, and of course it's only, it's using seven, we're assigning it seven to make this structure work. Notice we're fulfilling the octet rule for all the elements in this case uh, so far. This oxygen it's assigned these two lone pairs and half of its bonding. That's the rule with assigned. And it makes a lot of sense when you circle these. So this is six valence electrons minus, okay, six. So this is a zero, and this is a preferred structure. That means we are using in this diagram that we're proposing for this uh, sulfur trioxide that oxygen is using all the electrons it brings to the table with its six, and that's a more realistic um a number here. Now this sulfur, and it's getting kind of confusing, so we'll put the, the, the sulfur here is using half of its bonding, and notice it has what? Four in this case. So six minus four for the sulfur is plus two, and that's a more reasonable number than the plus three over here, but it's still pretty high. Okay, so continuing on our little trek here, Let's go, this oxygen is sharing one. It's negative one for reasons we should know now. This oxygen, ooh, it's good. It's 
uh, has a double bond, so it's assigned electrons as 6. 6 minus 6 is 0. For the same reasoning, this oxygen is assigned 6. 6 minus 6 is 0. And you could probably guess what's happening here. Let's change it up the color. And what we have here is sulfur. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And 6 minus 5 for the sulfur of course is plus one hey, that makes a lot of sense as in this case I got two zeros which is better than one zero the negative one is on the oxygen the sulfur is plus one okay let's see if the next one makes any sense okay or it makes any sense so far number three is the best because I have the greatest number of zeros and oxygen is negative one, which if there's going to be uh, someone who accepts electron, the more electronegative atom would, would do that. And then sulfur, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, has ten electrons in the central atom. That's doable because sulfur is a what? Rho three element. It has sp and d to draw from, and it, it can have an expanded octet. Okay, well, what about this one? We know that oxygen has six valence electrons and it's assigned six in this drawing. This oxygen, for the same reason, has zero. And this has zero. And if you can see party people, this sulfur now has six. And so six minus six is zero. Six valence electrons, and guess what? Six assigned. It has no lone pair, so half of its bonding, the assigned structure that we use in this drawing, is zero. So my friends, in chemistry, this is the best structure. Why? Because I have the lowest, okay, formal charges, all right, for all of the elements. And I can do it for this structure because sulfur is preferred, okay? Sulfur, I'm sorry, sulfur is an expanded octet, so we can have the eight. If you're doing this for other elements where you're in a row two, you couldn't do this, but this is the best structure. So four is the best structure, and the best reasoning here is that we have the lowest, or numbers of formal charges are closer to zero. All these zeros mean that I'm bringing all the electrons. So when you're thinking about which structure is preferred, with formal charges, we're looking for structures that have more zeros, okay? Don't say always the lowest number because you can have some negative ones. So you want the formal charges that approach the zero the best. If you have to have a negative number, it would go on the what? More electronegative number. In this case, these are all zeros. These are all bringing the electrons that they have to the table to make this drawing work, and that is the most reasonable structure, okay? Hope that helped.